Thank you for everyone for coming. Uh, well, we just had the mass. I think the Holy Spirit is still here, so I guess we don't have to invoke him to come anymore. He's here, and I believe it. Uh, Jesus is still in me, and I think that uh, he's doing good work too. Hmm. It's just a uh, good evening once again, everybody. Uh, thinking about this talk today, when some people that like kind of remind me of like what it was said in the advertise and talk about uh, Father of so provoking thought, make me feel scared. The thing is, I don't want anyone after this talk come after me and be provoked in anger and say something bad. Okay, do not provoking thought, not about provoking anger. I hope that that's clear out. And second thing, I want to clarify something. That is, you know, uh, this talk is about the sacrament of marriage, the sacrament that most of you live out. And the thing is, sometimes we talk about Catholic church teaching, but that doesn't mean that Catholic people live it. And so by looking at each other, how we live out the sacrament, doesn't mean it's a complete the way the church intend, the way the Lord intend us to live out a sacrament. And so I'm going to go back a lot on what the catechesis, uh, catechism of the Catholic Church taught about it, what scripture talk about it, and then we develop and see for ourselves what exactly the Lord wants us to live out the sacrament of marriage. First of all, I would like to uh, address a uh, time of uh, marriage relationship that usually people have uh, when they get into marriage. Um, normally, we can see it's like, we, I can categorize it into three types. First, it could be like, hey, they live even though they marry each other, but they live as though they are boyfriend and girlfriend. There's nothing like a real commitment into this. Uh, there's no binding. Um, they only last until, last as long as I'm happy. You saw that a lot. I mean, you can saw, I mean, like, if you look at about the news about all those Hollywood uh, actor and actress, I mean, they can divorce as whenever they don't feel happy anymore. Just say goodbye. And there's nothing that binds them together. Nothing whatsoever. And then we have another kind of marriage relationship. That is, they certainly have some kind of commitment. Their commitment lasts as long as each of them hold on to the expectation. Uh, I consider it's like, okay, it's a contract kind of relationship. It's a limited binding as long as, uh, as an agreement between the couple. And so, if it happened that one of them didn't hold up their part, like happened to be unfaithful, I happen to do something that the other party was like really devastated. Divorce happened. They don't want to stay in this marriage anymore. Goodbye. Uh, we have a third type of uh, marriage, which is they treat it as a covenant. And just like Jesus said in uh, the gospel, he mentioned the original plan of God about marriage. Is this kind of marriage that the two become one flesh. And this is God who binds them together. It doesn't have to be a Catholic marriage. It's everywhere. You can have Buddhists marry each other and they understand that they have to stay with one another until death do they part. It doesn't have to be Catholic. It doesn't have to be Christian. Everybody come to the marriage Intuitively, they understand that this marriage should last forever. As our ancestors, they understand that. They doesn't have to be Catholic. And so, what's so special about Catholic marriage? The, in the introduction about the sacrament of marriage, this is what the Catholic, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, that's how they wrote. I was wrote, the matrimonial covenant by which a man and a woman establish between themselves a partnership of a whole of life 
is by its nature ordered toward the good of the spouses and the pro pro procreation and education of offspring. This covenant between baptized persons has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament. Okay, so according to this sentence, the covenant, the marriage covenant already there. The two purpose of marriage already there. That is for the good of the spouse and for procreation for children and raise up children. It's already there. It's nothing new. And then it been raised up one level higher. That is a sacrament. And so uh, today I'm not going to tell you about like, okay, you're supposed to, like, as a Catholic couple, you're supposed to stay with one another for life. Or I can say, uh, I, do, I don't have to tell you about like, okay, marriage is about having children and raise them, uh, raise them well, uh, have a, give them a good education. That is everybody out there is supposed to do. Everybody is supposed to do. Today, I only emphasize to you the idea of what exactly that the Lord did when raised a marriage into the level of a sacrament. So what is a sacrament? A sacrament, according to the definition, uh, is a sacraments are uh, efficacious size of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed to us. So the sacrament is a sign of grace. There's something about visible sign, something that we can see, we can like kind of point at it, like, that's it, I saw it, that's it, that is a sacrament. Something visible, something that we can point to. The second thing about a sacrament is this, it is a work of Christ. Or over here it said, Christ himself at work. Something that Jesus is at work, something that Jesus is doing, something that relates strongly with Jesus. And the third element I want to emphasize in, in this is, it unites, whatever happened in the sacrament, it unites the people, the person, in a living union with Jesus. So something that we can see. And through it, we see, we know that Jesus is at work. And whatever effect it brings, it has to unite us with Jesus. There's three elements. Well, there's a lot of elements, but I just want to focus on three. Otherwise, you're going to stay here until tomorrow. That's what one I want to be clear. Okay, so marriage as a sacrament. First, it is a sign. What sign? Well, generally, people said in Scripture, St. Paul point out, uh, the relationship of husband and wife is the relationship of Christ and the church. Or they should be the sign of the relationship between Christ and the church. So they are the sign of Christ's love for the church. That is a sign that they intend to. So when you marry each other, when you love each other, you show others how Christ loved the church. It does not limit, it's like, oh, the husband had to be Christ and the wife had to be the church. Everyone who been baptized was called to be Jesus. Everybody called to be Jesus. Doesn't matter if you're male or female, you are called to be Jesus. You have to live out your life in Jesus and this sacrament requests you to live out your life at Jesus in this particular way. Ah, and so, the sign of Christ's love for the church. And so how is the Christ himself at work? This is how it's, do, how, how it's supposed to be, do, be done. That is, Christ loves me through my spouse and loves my spouse through me. That is the way. Christ at work in the spousal relationship that is true, my spouse. I experience Jesus. 
and through me, my spouse experienced Jesus. This is go back to the, the sign. You know, this is the thing, okay, if one of us, one of you is Jesus, then the other is the church, and the person who is the church should experience the fullness of the love of Christ for the church, right? And so it's just clearly as if you live it out correctly, then the person will experience Christ's love for the church. And he, how did he love? He loved wholeheartedly. He loved by giving up his life totally to cleanse his church with his blood. And so each of you, when you step into a marriage relationship, you are called to die for your spouse, the way Christ died for the church. And effectively, your spouse experience what is called to be Christ's love. What is to be Christ's love? And it also, but live this out, you fulfill one of the important things, the most important commandment by Christ himself. This is how all will know that you are my disciple if you have love for one another. Lo the commandment of love. Love one another as I have loved you. Mm. Love one another as I have loved you. And he picked one particular person and gave you that commandment to live out. That is your spouse. He picked one particular family that you supposed to live that commandment now. That's your family. It's not like, okay, love everybody out there. You are entrusted with one special mission. Your own husband, your own wife, your own children, the one you're supposed to die for. You only have one life. You're not going to die for everybody in the world. I hope that you can be like Mother Teresa, pick the, like dying people on the street. But you know that not all of us are called to be like that. You're called to die for your spouse and for your children, for your own family. And that is how Christ at work in you and through you. I also have another quote from the first letter of St. John. God is love, and whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him. You are called to be like Christ, right? So how can the world know about Christ? They saw it in you. How do they know about Christ love somebody? They saw it how you love your spouse and love your family. That you be there for them, day in and day out. And the third element of the sacrament, unite the faithful to Christ. I become Christ for my spouse, allowing my spouse to experience Christ through me and vice versa. I saw this element in this scripture, uh, in this verse uh, from the letter of St. Paul to Colossians. In my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in the affliction of Christ on behalf of his body, which is the church. This verse is very strange. St. Paul, he supposed to be a great one, the greatest theologian, but people would say, well, what is he talking? What is he talking about? Everybody knows that Christ already died and his, like, his suffering is like enough to save the whole world. There's nothing lacking in the suffering of Christ. What's, what is St. Paul talking about here? He's talking about a reality that many people out there never saw, never see Christ in their life. Just like you and me, never see Jesus in person, right? And so that is the lacking. Even though Jesus shed blood for you, but you never see Jesus in person. And so Paul, he said, I'm standing here dying for you. That is how Christ dying for you. That is the key. 
each of us need to see Christ in person. That is called the mystery of incarnation. That's Jesus come in, the Son of God come in the flesh. That I can see, I can touch, I can smell, I can know Him. I can point to Him and say, that is how God loved me. And I need that one person in my life. At least one person show me. Like your children, they need to know God how. They saw it in you, the way you were there for them since the first moment they opened their eyes until they become a man or woman. And you're always there for them. They can't always trust you. The way we all learn how to trust is through our parents, didn't we? And so we show others who Jesus is through our own way that we love somebody. Not some outsider. First star with your own household. That is the key. One another, another interesting thing is this. Out of the seven sacraments, the first three is called the sacrament initiation. Uh, baptism, Eucharist, and Confirmation. It initiates pers a person to uh, become a member of the church. And second two, I mean the, the, the second, uh, the, the, the next two is the Sacrament of Reconciliation and the Sacrament of Anointing the Sick. They were characterized as the Sacrament of Healing. And the last two, the Sacrament of Holy Order and the Sacrament of Marriage was categorized as something called the sacrament at the service of communion. It relates to a vocation in life. And so I see the link right here. That is, if I'm a priest being ordained to be Jesus for the whole community in a sacramental way, in, uh, I can say it's like, in like, uh, I receive the power to celebrate other sacrament. Then you who are married with one another has been ordained to be Jesus Christ to your own family. Not in the sense of authority of power, but in love in affection. If I am Jesus Christ standing up here and tell you about all his teaching and provide you with a sacrament, I can tell you about how Christ, how Jesus is good and this is how he do it thing and how he love you and I tell you about his idea. And it's all good. You can see how Christ stand up and be in the crowd. But what lacking is this? somebody who lived with you as Christ would live with you. That I cannot do. I can be personal Christy on the altar, but I cannot be personal Christy in your bedroom. How long can I stay with you to show that Jesus Christ stay with you when you up and when you down, when you sick and when you healthy? How long can I stay with you? Think about this. How can I say Christ is faithful to you all the time when I barely see you in a couple minutes? Somebody out there had to show you that type of Christ, right? How about this? Jesus said that the good shepherd knows his sheep, right? He called them by name, right? I don't remember anyone's name. And then they talk about the good shepherd lead the sheep uh, to the green pasture, right? And they recharge them, right? They, he he, he going to make sure that they've been cared for, right? He always there with them, right? I cannot. You cannot demand a priest doing that, don't you? And who's going to be that good shepherd for you? The seven sacraments provide us the life with Christ. And the sacrament of marriage provides just that. Somebody to be Christ in your life 
when you up, when you down, when you rich, when you poor, when you sick, when you healthy, when you happy, when you sad, when you laughing, when you crying. That guy, Jesus. And that is when you hold on, embrace your loved one. You are Jesus embracing your spouse, and your spouse is Jesus embracing you. You know this is how much Jesus loves you. You become image of Christ, personal Christi, in a different way. The sacrament of marriage is a sacrament of love. The sacrament of love. Because the power that is provided for the person to receive the sacrament is the power of love, not authority. Not authority. Not authority. The affection you have. Who can truly know you? Big old people in the world. Who can possibly know you best as Christ in the flesh for you? Is it the priest? He barely know you. He don't even remember your name. If you even have a good priest remember your name, he have no idea what you doing. How about this? You know, Jesus knows all things, right? Sometimes I sin, but I didn't know. But probably, when you sin, you're, you didn't know about your sin, but your spouse know. How about that? Know you so well. Because that person was ordained to be Jesus for you. And you are ordained to be Jesus for that person. Remember this. The last two sacraments relate to a vocation. The calling to live out for somebody else out there, not to receive. I become a priest doesn't mean that I'm being ordained so that I can receive your affection. No, I ordain a priest in order to serve you. Then you too being ordained as spouse, as husband, as wife, as parent, as father, as mother, is to serve, not to just simply receive. Whatever you receive is a reward from God the Most High. Just like the way I receive is from a reward from God, not a wage, and not something that I can demand. And so are you. So are you. You are entrusted with special tasks to make sure this little human being know Jesus. You fulfill what lacking in the suffering of Christ. That is an image for somebody else to see. That's it. That's the key of the sacramental understanding of marriage. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. The understanding of Marriage at a sacrament also entail another element. That is the sacredness of marriage. A sacredness of marriage. All sacraments are sacred. In fact, all things that relate to God are sacred. Are sacred. Sacrament especially. When we talk about sacred, if we compare like, okay, we, we got to identify between sacred and mundane. And so we we consider it like something that belongs to God only and something that be, just belongs to um, the whole world. And so sacrament is something sacred because it comes from God. And so first of all, did my ordination of priesthood stop after the mass of ordination end? You think? No. I was ordained there in order to continue to serve as a priest, and my sacrament lasts for a lifetime, right? Right? I'm still a priest now, right? I hope. <laughs> so, the sacrament that you receive as husband and wife, it doesn't stop with a wedding ceremony. 
And so the sacredness of your sacrament didn't stop with the mass, with the wedding mass. It goes all the time. Just like I'm an ordained person, I'm a sacred person. I belong to Christ totally, belong to the church, and that's why I have to make a vow of celibacy, because my body, my mind, everything should belong to the church and to Christ. And so, you also belong to Jesus in a special way and belong to one another in a special way. You are sacred because you receive that sacrament. You are no longer a person who are freely to be themselves. You belong to God now in a special way. That's why listen to the letter to Hebrew. Let marriage be honored among all and the marriage bed be kept undefiled. What should undefiled? Something has to be sacred there. Because if it's not sacred, there's no point of saying undefiled. It's sacred. Your marriage bed is sacred. Talk about marriage bed. It also brings up another idea up. Like, you know, as a priest, I call to serve in a sanctuary. Right? And where is your sanctuary? When I serve as a priest, I have a sacred time and sacred space. My sacred space is where I sang the Mass. My sacred time is when the Mass is celebrated. What about you? Where is your sacred time? Where is your sacred space? The purpose of marriage being fulfilled. You know, the sacrament of marriage, they said that it's only fulfilled when you come to make, come together in the flesh. And so the ordination of the priest only actually become actualized when I say my first mass, right? And so with that idea, don't you realize the reason why St. Paul said that let your marriage bed undefiled? That is your sacred space right there. And, it's, and when you come together, it becomes your sacred time. This is not a time to become dirty. It is sacred. It is sacred. This is, I invite you, when you come to bed to one another, look at each other in the eye and fill with love and know the source of your love. It's not just simply some like tinkling in your body or some brain chemical come because some male and female come together like animal. No, it's God. Because your love is not a love of animal. You love different. You love secretly. You love because God entrusts the love that he has for this particular person that is your spouse. And so he entrusts you with a duty to carry it out. Do you realize that? Do you realize why you come in love with one another? Who was the one who lead you to one another? Who is the one who formed the bond of love between you two? You receive it and you didn't realize the source of this great gift. And do you realize the purpose of this great gift? It has a purpose. It's not just simply to be happy. Be happy is just an extra gift, a duty of to make this person experience love and care. That is your duty. And so the same way, a sacred bed, a sacred bedroom, a sacred space where love happens, that is something, sometimes I think the word got to make this become mundane, so they call it private space. But that's not true. It's sacred. And that's why you don't just let anyone step into that place. Even though it's not the time that you sleep to one another. You don't just let anyone to jump in. One of the room that's like the guests can come to the living room, can come to the kitchen, and then even can come to the bathroom, the restroom. But they shouldn't just burst into your bedroom, right? 
because it's your sacred space. Only occasionally that you allow them in because of some other thing, but they have no right to step into that place because that's a place where holy things happen, not dirty things. Holy things happen. This is when you make the love of Christ present for one another. Have you realized that? Another thing, after marriage, husband and wife are not their own, but belong to God through each other. Here the quote I have is, the husband should fulfill his duty toward his wife, likewise the wife toward her husband. The, a wife does not have authority over her own body, but rather the husband, and similarly, a husband does not have authority over his own body, but rather his wife. You belong to one another because Christ ordained you to belong to one another. Your body is no longer your own. And so when you come to one another, it's not because you have an urge. It's it because it's your duty to let your spouse know that God care and love that person. Love, care, your spouse. So do not let sexual desire control you. You control it. You control it. Control it. Because if you let your sexual desire control you, what do we call? We call lust. But if you control it, because you know sexuality is a good thing, it's a gift. It's used for the right purpose. And yet, we have a sin we call lust. This is when it overcome you. And so the reverse, the right way to use it is to control it. Control it doesn't mean you suppress it, but rather to bring it out for the service of others as the sacrament you receive, the sacrament to serve. The sacrament to serve. And then let the Lord be the one who reward you back with the great feeling, the enjoyment of it. The enjoyment of it. The enjoyment of your own sexual activity. Let the Lord reward you. Why do you claim it on your own? Let the Lord reward you. And His reward is abundant. That's why natural family planning is a great thing. Because in that, husband and wife learn how to control the sexual urge, sexual desire, and only give to one another in proper time and proper place because they love one another. See, they control the sexual desire. They didn't act upon it, but rather give it in proper time and place. And that's why the rate of those who faithfully follow natural, natural family planning was so low. In fact, it's like, according to the last statistic I received, 0.2%. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? You know that the rate of divorce was like about 50% in America. How can you get that low? If not God who takes care of it. And he reward other things with that too. Another thing, as all sacrament, marriage demands we treat its object and minister with respect. Treat with respect. The quote that I have here from 1 Peter 3, 1 to 2 and 7 is talk about the way the ancient time they respect one another. Ancient time husband and wife respect one another because the husband is the breadwinner. So he can't bring home uh, much like money. Then he have a certain authority over it. The wife is the one who serves at the house. And so he, she has the duty and the responsibility of the house. According to that, then you have the husband was considered as a more dominant role than the wife. 
But ultimately, the church teaching underlies is the equal role. Each person has his role and should respect one another in that role. And as a priest, I was respected by you. I mean, I'm, I'm just at awe at the way you respect me. Hey, I'm a kid. Call to more. Many of you, I was a, I'm a kid. And many of you still make a comment like, I look like a kid. I'm still dancing around on the altar. But you respect me because I am a minister, was ordained for this duty. And so, you, husband and wife, you were ordained to be Christ to one another. Why don't you respect one another as the image of Christ given to you? If you respect the priest, then respect your spouse. Respect the role that they play in the house. You will come to an agreement when you marry one another about what should we do, how you take care of one another, who will pay the bill, who will take care of the children, who pick out the trash. So respect each other in their duty. Let them have the right to do their thing in their own way as long as it's fulfilled. Respect each other, then the Lord will reward you with a respectful relationship. And you respect others and you will receive the respect back. The Lord is fair. That's why he said the husband and wife sanctify each other. Because as long as you show Christ in you, then remember your spouse and your family will be touched by Christ. And when you have your children, they, how do they learn how to respect you? By the way, your, your spouse respect you and you respect your spouse. How the children can learn respect if nobody in the house respect anyone? That's why the whole world is running amok, because nobody knows how to respect. And then like, you respect your parents, then the children will learn how to respect their grandparents. They learn from you. But ultimately, respect each other because of God. Because of God. Another idea of the sacredness of marriage is this. It's sacred because it relates to your body. Marriage is sacred because your body is sacred. How? How so? You know, St. Paul, he said in the letter to Corinthians, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. So, think about this. If my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when Paul used the word temple, he means like the way the, the Jerusalem temple back then. And that way is like the Jerusalem temple. There's only one person can step into the place, holy of holy. That is the high priest. And we only have one high priest. Now after, this, uh, the, the, after Jesus comes, we only have one high priest, it's Jesus. And so basically he can say that, okay, your body, your body didn't belong to anyone. Shouldn't belong to anyone. And nobody should have the right of the totality of your body. And yet, on the same letter, he talked about husband have the right over their wife, his wife's body and wife have the right over their husband's body. Because husband and wife, you are each other high priest. Then you see the connection right there? Only the high priest can have the right to enter the holy of holy. And think about that. When the priest stepped into the holy of holy, he venerated, he cared for, he worshiped God in it. And so when husband and wife come together, your body belongs to one another, and you express gratitude to the Lord through your interaction with the totality of your body. And that's the lead to another thing. Your body should not be exposed to anyone else besides your spouse. That is something this society forgot. Your body is sacred. That's why you shouldn't expose it. It's not because it's dirty. It's because it's too sacred. 
It's not because it's dirty of original sin. Our lady does not have original sin. Why does she have to cover herself? Because her body is sacred. It should not be exposed to anyone. And so you too. And you've been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Your body should be sacred too, and only a certain person should see it. And so that's why the religious sister is not going to expose their body to anyone else because their body only belongs to God. And me too. A consecrated man shouldn't expose his body to anyone else because body already belongs to God. Anything impurity should not relate to this body. And that's why there shouldn't be any sexual activity before marriage because your body was not belong to anyone yet only God and you wait until some God ordains somebody into step into the body, your body. Wow. Wow. Your body is sacred. Also come back to another idea I said before. It's because you are the image of God. If you truly use it well as the image of God to somebody, then the word of the word of scripture and the word had, be, had was made flesh and dwell among us. It's, remember, is it your body that God had become flesh so that others can see his love? Saint Paul he expo- Ex, like he, he even like uh, not Saint Paul, but Pope John Paul II in his theology, the body even go a little further. He point out the idea behind all this. This his uh, thesis: the body is capable of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and divine. It has been created to transfer into the visible reality of the world, the mystery behind from eternity in God and thus be a sign of it. So my body expressed something more than just a piece of flesh. My body expressed something deeper, a spiritual reality that directly come from God. So like when I show my hand gesture like this, it's not just simply a sense structure. I'm giving a message that hidden from the bottom of my heart. So like think about this. Why the gaze of your spouse is different than any other people look? Why have a certain affection on you? Because it's from, it gave a deeper message, a spiritual reality, a message from God. So it's not just sacred in the sense that you go to bed with one another. It's sacred every time you express your love. And that is the beauty of natural family planning. It teach you husband and wife express their love not just simply in bed, but everywhere because you control the love in bed and so you have to express in other things. When you're going out with one another, why is it different than going out with a friend? When you smile with one another, what's different than smile with your friend out there or with somebody out there? When, you're, when you cook for one another, does it make a difference compared to you cook for your friend or cook for the priest? Oh, gee. You express something deeper, and so should be respect. And when you receive something deeper like that, you should respect the one who gave that to you. And that's why you should respect one another deeply, brothers and sisters. Because it's not about a thing, just a little thing. I mean, like, come on, you can go out and buy food from the store. You can warm it up with a microwave. But if your wife cook for you, it means different. And if your husband cook for you, it definitely means different. Definitely. It's not about the food. 
It's about what you want to express to one another, right? That's why it's sacred. And so you create memories. When you express love, when you go out, when you cook, when you do something with one another and create great memory, you consider that memory is sacred to you. You did it all the time, but you didn't have that name, right? You did it all the time. You remember the day. You remember the moment. You remember a good time. They are sacred memory. That's why, God forbid, some people, when their spouse die, they keep on remembering all this good moment because it's sacred to them. Nobody can take it away from them. It's sacred. Another thing make marriage sacred is because your sexuality is sacred. It's touched a lot in theology of the body. I'm not going to spend the whole time on theology of the body, but I want to pick little thing here and there. According to the theology of the body, God created us, male and female, so that we could image image, we could image his love by becoming a sincere gift to each other. So God created male and female, and so that this man and this woman can become gift for one another. Your husband is the gift that God gave you, and wife, you are the gift of God to your husband, a gift from God a gift from God. And it also helps you to reflect the reality of the union of God. This is what is said in the book of Genesis chapter 1. God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay, so does God have kind of like distinction between male and female. Does a father is a male and then on the son is a female or the Holy Spirit is a female? There's no sex in God, right? They actually one. They three person but one in unity. So there's no distinction in, in sex regarding God. And so how can we be created in God's image and why don't we just become all male or all female? Why we become different? Because the image is not about how we look or how our body part is. Our image of God is the union of love. Become one. And the only for two become one is a male and a female come together and unite with one another. And it's not like an animal as a male and female come together because as a human, when you come together, you express a divine love, divine union. Divine union. And so the love that the husband and wife have is the image of the unity of God, the unity of the Trinity. We reflect the image and likeness of the Holy Trinity in the self giving love between a man and a woman. Another thing. When God unites in love, his love is not just simply self consumed, his love bursts forward, gives life. His love gives life. And so if we are the image of God's love, we too in that union should give life and should open to life. In God's love, there's no selfishness. There's no just self-indulgence or self-satisfaction. God's love is to give life. And anything that contradicts to that is not truly God's love. And so contraception is destroying 
we destroying us as human beings, as image of God, because it just simply contradicted with what God created us to be. And yet, natural family planning is not like that. Because God gives life and He has a plan. He doesn't just like boom and everything happened everywhere. No, everything gradually happened according to God's plan. And so when husband and wife come together, arrange things properly, in good order, in harmony, they reflecting God's way of love. And they provide life. Even when couple cannot have children, there, if they reflect the true love of God, they will become the source of happiness to many people around them. The true, mar the true sacrament of marriage in a couple should be a marriage that when you come to their house, you feel welcome. And when they come to you, you feel filled with love from them. That their love is not just in themselves, but actually reach out to you and because their love just so filled, they no longer have fear in them. They know that they can always entrust their spouse to other beauty. No doubt, no fear. It's just overwhelming happiness. Want to bring out to others the joy that you want to tell the whole world that God's love is great. That's the way the sacrament of marriage should be. The reflection of God's love should be. And so we lead to now you understand it's just a part, it's just a surface of divine plan in the sacrament of marriage, the sacrament of God's love in your life. We come a reality of the danger that is destroying it. The first danger, the, re, the real danger, not the first, but the real danger that destroy marriage is sin. I'm not talking about unfaithfulness only. People just think that, okay, only unfaithfulness can destroy, destroy marriage. That is not true. That is not true. Unfaithfulness could be a result of the sin way before that. The root of sin way before that. If you have your spouse is a prideful person, it's going to be very hard to have a loving connection. If you have your spouse is a jealous person, it is very hard to be able to express that love, the, the love that God intends you to have. If you have your spouse filled with anger, it's going to be really hard. If you spare, your, your, your spouse is greedy, they worshiping money rather than God and definitely won't care about you. You definitely will be considered as lower than money. And laziness, oh, gee, just don't do the chore. I mean, how can you stand? You see, all sin. And what about lust? Even lust after you is dangerous because you would think, you would realize your spouse, what is important to your spouse is probably just sexual activity. And how can you trust a person when you're away from home? when that person just always desired. See, doesn't need to come to unfaithfulness. Doesn't need to come to unfaithfulness. And ultimately, the, the thing is this, this, what is sin? Sin is just simply a rejecting of God's love. The ultimate thing is the reason why sin, danger, marriage, is because sin blocked the image of God in that person. And if that person, the image of God being blocked from that person, then how can that person carry out the duty that he or she will call for? To be Jesus. How can I be sinful and be Jesus at the same time? Jesus does not sin. How can I be hateful and be Jesus at the same time? Jesus does not hate. You see? So ultimately, sin danger, marriage, doesn't matter what kind of sin. 
And ultimately, remember, the Ten Commandments, the first is honor God. So if your spouse neglecting God, I'm sorry, how can that person express God's love to you when he doesn't or she didn't care about God? Right? If, God is not, if there's no God in their life, then what can you do? I mean, how can we reflect on God when there's no God in his or her life? And, and so now we know what danger, danger, danger marriage. So what, what, can, what can restore, what, what can actually restore marriage? What can renew, what, what can actually renew marriage? So what is the, the re remedy of sin? What is the, the cure for sin? Forgiveness. How did you win, like, release from your sin? You go to confession, right? It's not just simply prayer. You go to confession to be released from your sin. And so the same way, how, what, what happened in confession? A person, a person act in the person of Christ, forgive you. And so in marriage, the same way, to renew your marriage, then the person who act in the person of Christ release you from your sin by forgiving you. By forgiving you. This is a crucial thing. Because forgiveness comes from God alone. In Scripture, the story of the man who been paralyzed and been dropped down from the rooftop and carried to Jesus, and Jesus said, oh, your sin are forgiven. And all the Pharisees said, well, what is that man talking about? And it's only, only God can forgive. And truly so, Jesus didn't say, deny it. He simply take it. Yeah, I can forgive. Hiddenly, he said, I'm God. I'm acting the person of God. And so, when you are able to forgive, is it God act through you? And so, another thing is, if you are unable to forgive, then ask God to send that grace to you so that you can forgive. Because forgiveness does not come from you. It comes from God. You just simply have to ask the source, Lord, I cannot forgive. Come, give the grace of forgiveness to me so that I can forgive. I don't have it. And so do not condemn yourself. You cannot forgive. Just simply ask. Ask. Keep asking until you have it. Do not bombard yourself with guilt. Ask. Ask for more. One time, not enough. Two times, ask a hundred times until God cannot stand you anymore and said, okay, that's it. Do it. <laughs> okay, now we know the danger and now we know how to save it. And so what well, you don't want the danger to happen, so how about like keep on going? What can help or strengthen your marriage? Well, what strengthen, what strengthen your relationship with God? Prayer. Go to the sacrament. Make sure that you always connect with God. Then you connect with His image. You connect with His power. And you can do all things when you're with Him. That is just connect with God. But in order for the power of God to be at work, We need to trust, to have faith. Every time Jesus go around and express his power of healing, he requires faith. That is why in the gospel, the story, when Jesus go, to, go back to his uh, native place, Nazareth, the village of Nazareth, he cannot do miracle because people don't have faith. They have his presence. He's there. They couldn't do anything because they didn't have faith. They didn't trust him. They didn't trust in his power. And so, you should trust in God. And go back a little bit. Who brought you two together? As I said, 
the power of love come from God and God brought you two together. Did he try to lie to you? Did he try to put a stumbling block for you? Did he try to make your life miserable? God never do that. And so when he brought you two together, he must have a plan. He must know that there's a challenge ahead, but he knows that he can somehow pull you through, right? Otherwise, it will be very cruel of him. Know that you're going to fail and still force you to do it. What kind of parents is he? What kind of parents is he? He has to know that you can actually have a happiness in this. That is why he brought you two together and connect you two together, bind you together with the bond of love. Then you can always come back to him and nag him when things go wrong. You can always return to the Lord. Lord, you promised me on the day of marriage when I make my vow with my spouse. I know that you are there and you didn't stop me. You actually encouraged me because I saw sigh and wonder that you actually bring this person to me and really invite me to take the vow of marriage. Then Lord, it's your job because I'm our power here. Hey, God holds himself responsible too. Right? Imagine if you have a daughter. He's going to marry a man, and you know that he's going to be a thug. He's an addicted person. He's going to destroy your girl's life. Will you do something to stop it? You would allow it to go through only when you believe is it possible for her to have happiness. And as parents, when your little girl marries in trouble, would you just stand away like, oh, wow, it's your job now? Or you actually come in, you know you hold yourself responsible because you actually want them to marry each other? You know that you hold yourself responsible for this too because you encourage them, right? What about God? Hey, he's more powerful than you. He know more than you. He wiser than you. Then he has to do something about it, right? Have you ever think about nagging God when your marriage have trouble? Invite him in and do something about it. In fact, sometimes I invite you to step back and let God do his thing. Do not mess it up. Do not mess it up. Just let God do his thing. Just simply be good and stand there and wait. The power that we have with God is the power of trust. When we trust in the Lord, He cannot just stand still. He has to do it. Just like your children, if they trust in you, you cannot just simply stand still when they face danger and hardship. God loves you more than you love your children, definitely. And so, that is the way you should walk with your marriage. Okay, oh, I have about 12 minutes for question. <laughs> okay, any question? Any question? Everybody understood. I'm so happy. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I cut this version short because I gave to the, the couple uh, that prepare for marriage a two hour talk. And I still want to talk more, so I think that I cut back a lot. So <laughs> I, well, of course, there are many little elements in the marriage, but I didn't say it here. Mm -hmm. So if you have no question, I would like to thank you for, uh, yes? Oh, OK, OK. OK, we'll, we, we do something special. OK.
Let us pray. <coughs> Almighty and eternal God, you have so exalted the unbreakable bond of marriage that it has become the sacramental sign of your son's union with the church and his spouse. Look favor on those couple, this couple who's, who right here, whom you have united in marriage as they ask for your help and the protection of the Virgin Mary. They pray that in good times and in bad, they will grow in love for each other, that they will resolve to be of one heart in the bond of peace. Lord, in their struggles, let them rejoice that you are near to help them. In their needs, let them know that you are there to rescue them. In their joys, let them see that you are the source and completion of every happiness. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll go and have a good night.